uh, religious leaders, and um, it's in Mark chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3. The, the lesson starts off by, uh, uh, with uh, speaking about how that Jesus uh, con confronts uh, or whatever, he, he establishes, that's what I'm looking for, he establishes his authority by his life and by his works, you know. So as we look at the life and work, works of Jesus, we find that it is all about establishing who he is. And then it goes on to talk about how that his kingship was... Um, uh, in reference to his his um, lineage and being in the the line of David, but of course um, that um, it continued to be used or spoken of as he expressed his power and authority and the, the things that he did in his ministry. And um, Jesus Christ was the divinely appointed king. Uh, he introduced a new mystery into the kingship by his authority over the unseen powers. And this is where, when we have the, um, oh, the calming of the storm, the casting out of uh, the, 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 the demons, the healing of individuals, um, we see the, his power over the unseen. And no one had ever really spoken of that before. None of the prophets, maybe once or twice, but none of them were to the extent that Jesus was able to establish his authority over all things. And one of the, one of the things in our lesson, you, know, you always hear uh, how that, well, in the, in, the, in the story today, we have where the, the person is sick. And, you know, often um, the, the feeling was that if a person is sick, somebody has sinned, okay? So in, in, uh, in the sin, they, they were, that's why they're sick and they're being punished. You know, that was such a, even with Job, it was clear back in the time of Job. If good things happened, you were blessed by God. If bad things happened, you've sinned. Well, and we'll find out in today's lesson how that Jesus confronts that, that um, logic or that type of thinking. And uh, he also, uh, he, we see him, oh, uh, contending with the religious leaders of the first century and how that they questioned uh, his authority and they fought against him and, and, and what he was doing. And it was as if they were going to be able to uh, sustain their positions of their authority within the religious system if they could just denounce Jesus and, you know, pretend like he didn't really exist. And so um, that was their, how can I say it? It was their um, misunderstanding of, of why Jesus came that they were not able to to deal with what was going on in their own life. And uh, so they were not interested in, in the people. They were not interested in the um, ministry of Jesus and the good that he did. They were just interested in making sure that the laws that they had established were kept. And so, you know, it'd be, it would be like somebody ran a stop sign and there's an accident and someone is seriously injured. They don't call the, they wouldn't call the ambulance they would find the person for running the stop sign, you know, you know, um, so, or the fabled one that uh, the guy was in an accident and he was thrown, thrown through the windshield and they find him for leaving the scene of an accident. <laughs> it's not true, that's a joke, but, you know, it would be that type of, that type of thinking uh, that the Pharisees and the scribes were, you know, they didn't care that somebody was sick. For 38 years, they just saw that he was carrying a mat in, on the Sabbath, and that this is, you're breaking the law. Well, I've been sick for 38 years. doesn't matter to us. You're doing, you're breaking the law. So this is how the, the scribes uh, saw themselves and how that they saw Jesus. And he was just, you know, he was just breaking all their rules. And if he was, if he was really the Messiah, he would listen to them. <laughs> so... All right, so in our first part of our lesson is in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and we start at verse 3. And they uh, come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So there's this guy who is sick of the palsy. Um, <clears throat> the, um, 
Palsy could have been a couple of things. I, I looked it up. It could have been a um, uh, catalepsy. Catalepsy was uh, basically seizures uh, in which the body was rigid and there was no feeling. They were just a rigid, stiff. Or it could have been a tet tetanus in which the people had this tetanus bacteria in which uh, that had infected their, their muscles and infected them that they couldn't move and were in great pain all the time. We used to, uh, my mom would always tell us, well, you're going to get lockjaw. You know, <laughs> you know, you got, you trapped, you know, you got the running nail on your foot. Go get the shot. You know, you got to get this done. You don't want to get lockjaw. It's like, okay, can you imagine my jaw being locked shut? Well, what it is, it's the muscle goes into contractions and it, you know, it, it, it's extremely painful to, to move. And so that's what uh, this, perhaps what this palsy was that is being referred to. And so, uh, and when they could not come nigh, so the, he was born, this guy is sick, he's being carried by four of his friends, or four individuals who were bringing him to Jesus. And when they could not come nigh for the press, so when they couldn't get close to him, because of all the people surrounding him, uh, surrounding Jesus, they just went up on the roof, <laughs> uncovered the roof, tore it apart, and of course, in, in, in their type of roof was not like, you know, shingles and plywood, it was more of a thatch or, you know, perhaps an area that was covered with those long reeds and things, something like that. So they went up on the roof. I'd have been afraid of all falling through, but <laughs> they, they uncovered the roof. And, uh, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when he, wa when he saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. Well, after several weeks of uh, ministry, Jesus and the disciples were looking for a break. So they go back to Capernaum to kind of rest. But when they get to Capernaum, everybody was familiar with Jesus. They came in hordes to see him. Anybody who was sick or, you know, had a need, they were showing up for Jesus to, to heal them. And so... Um, when they, when, why were the people there? Um, many of them were there because of being sick. Some were there because they wanted to hear the message of Jesus. And of course, there were some who were there for curiosity. And of course, the scribes. I always wonder how the scribes got to be on the front row seat. <laughs> you know, they were, I think, they, well, they considered themselves above everybody else. And so they must have just, you know, I am, you know, move aside, I'm coming through. And so they are always up front watching and listening. And of course, they weren't trying to hear the message of Jesus. They were looking to find something wrong with him. And so whenever um, we have these four men, now I remember years ago, um, there was, you know, that if, if, um, if you were prayed, if a person was prayed for and they didn't get well, then people would start saying, well, you, didn't ha you don't have enough faith. And, you know, you don't have enough faith <clears throat> because if you had faith, you would be healed. So there was this, you know, there was a guilt trip. <laughs> Who wants to get prayed for? Not me. You're going to tell me I don't have enough faith if I don't get better. <coughs> well, excuse me. Sin in your life. That, that's always a good one. You know, there's something wrong with you. That's why you're not healed. God wants to heal. You're not healed. Therefore, you're to blame. Well, I always went back to this, this particular scripture because it wasn't the faith of the person who was sick. It was the faith of the person who, were, who was carrying him. <laughs> you see, Jesus saw their faith. And, and the important part of this is that each of us can help one another achieve or receive God's blessing in their life because we don't give up on them. <laughs> We don't give up on each other. You don't give up on the body of Christ. You don't, you don't let go of, you know, well, we got him here. We can't let him in. You know, you get down on your own. We got him up on the roof. You crawl down. <laughs> well, the guy can't move. He's paralyzed. He's stiff as a board, I guess. And so he can't get down to, to Jesus. And so he can't get in and he can't get down. So what are we going to do? So his friends then tore open the roof and let him down through the roof. So the, the faith of the person, perhaps he can't even talk. If he has this locked jaw, 
if he's got this palsy in which his muscles are frozen and he's like in a seizure state, uh, he can't basically do anything. So it's the faith of the people who are carrying him that brings him before Jesus. And so whenever we pray for one another, that's us carrying people. <laughs> that's, that's us doing our part. You know, each one of us have a responsibility to each other. And so when someone is, you know, the scripture says when someone is caught in sin, you know, we don't kick them out of the kingdom. We go and try to bring them back in, you know, uh, to, uh, oh, I don't want to say convince, but to, you know, use, allow the Holy Spirit to use us to speak with, about them, to bring them back into the fold. And uh, if they refuse, well, then that's their fault. But it isn't that pe we don't care. It's that we do care. And so we are responsible then to seek after, go after, help people in their, in their difficult times. So these four men um, were the ones who were uh, instrumental and this man uh, being healed and recovering from this dread disease that he had. Um, in verse 6, but there were certain of the scribes. <laughs> okay, the story is never complete without a certain scribes. <laughs> so there were certain of the scribes um, sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why did this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but only God? So Jesus in, in, is recorded here in verse 5. He says, thy sins be forgiven thee. Okay? So these scribes, these self-righteous critics, um, they are the ones who were the interpreters of the law, and that's what they gave their life to, was interpreting and, <laughs> I think, writing extra laws that they knew God would be fond of. <laughs> if I were God, I would think these are more laws that people should do, you know? They never thought about the people who were having to do them. They were just concerned that they could prove that they were better than someone else. And so when I, I think of, well, when people, people have a self-righteous condemnation, <laughs> that you, you're not, whenever there is a we're better than you mentality in the, in the, in the, in the body of Christ, that we've got it and you don't, they don't have it. <laughs> That's pride. And they tell you, you know, they tell you so that you don't have it. And it's like, okay, well, which, are you a Pharisee or are you a scribe? <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're willing to step out in faith and tell you you're not good enough. And well, where, if you were really sensitive, you would be one of the four trying to carry the other person to the presence of God. See? So, this, I don't know, garbage of people being superior is, you know, totally not of the body of Christ. And that we have a, we have a better mindset or a better, more faith than you do, because look what we have. It's like, no. Um, Jesus has a ministry and a part for each of us, and so we're, we're called to fulfill our part, and for, can we do it better? Yeah, but maybe we need carried. If you're that good, you could perhaps carry us. <laughs> so, just a little thought there. So never allow self-righteous critics to put you, to try to put, put you in your place whenever all they're doing is trying to infiltrate or in trying to um, lift themselves up, you know, fill up their bladder. <laughs> so, that's, that's my little soapbox. Didn't know I had a soapbox back here, did you? So anyhow, the scribes, um, uh, in any speech, they would always look for blasphemy. You know, you're blaspheming God. Now, when you think about it, blaspheming God is anything that is contrary to the honor of God. So when people are cursing, <laughs> they're blaspheming God. When you take the Lord thy God's name in vain, you are blaspheming God. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very shaky ground for people to, to be in. And you don't have to be judgmental. You can just look and hear what they're saying and you know it's blaspheming God. You better be careful. 
I was at the, you know, when I was around at the hospital and thing, and people would, you know, use the name of Jesus in a wrong way. I'd say, you know, I know that guy. <laughs> Did you? I'm, you're, you must be religious. You're talking to him. <laughs> and they would like what? What? Well, you were. You're talking about Jesus all the time. I didn't realize that you believed that much. And they, you know. And I never really got a bad remark, you know, coming back, saying anything. That They kind of would just hopefully pipe down, at least, you know, re were conscious of it in a, in, a more, uh, in, a, in a better way than what they were when they started. But one of the things is here that whenever the... Um, Scribes, um, whenever they had this, they had this feeling or they had this understanding that if you were sick, you would sin. Okay, we talked about that. Well, Jesus says here, thy sins be forgiven. Well, then in verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I want you to know this, that the, the Son of Man, me, has power to forgive sins. Now, any heretic can come along and say your sins are forgiven because nobody can really tell the difference. You know, <laughs> was what one brother Mickle used to say, the only difference, that you, what you, the, if, you're down to, if you don't have Christ as your sinner and you get, in, in, as your savior uh, and, and you get baptized, you go down a dry sinner and come up a wet sinner. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, so if you don't have Christ as your Savior, you're nothing but a wet sinner. So, <laughs> um, so Jesus is telling them here, you know, that there's a change. There's something going on here, and he has the power to forgive sins. And he says, I say to thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. Well, okay. Now, I want you to, uh, I want you to recognize I have the power to forgive sins because in your own thinking, scribes, Pharisees, in your own thinking, you believe this man is sinful, that's why he's sick. So I'm going to, I, Jesus, is going to make him well, and he's going to stand up and walk to his own house. Therefore, he must be forgiven. <laughs> he has to be forgiven in order to be made well. You, by their logic, yeah. So he was actually just, you know, you know, you know, here's, here's your logic. You know, here's your thinking. He, I'm, he, this Jesus is blaspheming God. He, nobody but God can forgive sins, okay? If nobody but God can forgive sins, stand up and walk. His sins are forgiven. Why? Because he couldn't be well if he wasn't forgiven. That's your theology, right? <laughs> so he confronted them with it all the time, but of course... They, they never made it, they never got past their hatred and their um, dislike for Jesus. So, in, in effect, in effect, it, it, this is the kind of the paraphrase of what we just said. You declare, meaning Jesus is speaking to the, the scribes, you declare that I have no right to forgive sins. Excuse me. You believe that if this man is sick, he is a sinner, and that he cannot be cured until he is forgiven. Watch this. <laughs> yeah, watch this, you know. So, stand up. So he stands up. So, when Jesus spoke the word and the man was healed, according to their beliefs, the man could not be cured unless he was first forgiven. He, he was cured, therefore forgiven. In their theology so he was he was actually confronting them they're sitting there being critical of him but Jesus knew their thoughts and he knew their faulty logic and so he just flat out challenged their faulty logic and of course they loved him for it <laughs> no <laughs> they would have preferred him to remain a, a cripple and Therefore, Jesus would not re, would we get, uh, get popularity. The next part of our, our, our lesson is uh, about Matt, Jesus being with uh, the Republicans and sinners. <laughs> Maybe it's Democrats and sinners. Who knows? 
But the idea, we do know, publicans and sinners. <laughs> so that Matthew was a tax collector, and he was, um, he was most despised because he was, he was a Jew, and he worked for the Roman government, and he collected taxes. Now, the reason tax collectors were um, despised is, let's just say that if you were, collect, you were the person collecting taxes for your region, and you, could, you needed to, to collect $1,000 for Rome, if you got $3,000, you kept the two and just paid Rome one. So tax collecting was a great business <laughs> because you could collect the taxes with the Roman soldiers enforcing you and protecting you. So the, the Jewish people hated the Romans and they hated more uh, Jews who would work for the Roman government. And <laughs> they would hire people who were local who knew what everybody made. <laughs> so they, 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 they were smart people. So when it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meal at, in his house, many of the publicans and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So what happens is Matthew's the tax collector. Matthew comes to, um, to Jesus, and he's a follower of Jesus. Now, the, the idea is either he um, immediately has this dinner for Jesus, and he wants, his, he wants the other tax collectors and all the people who are considered sinners that Matthew ran with, he wants to have a dinner, and he wants to introduce them to Jesus. Sounds logical. <laughs> but what happens is Jesus is having dinner with all these sinners and the scribes. They show up. <laughs> and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? <laughs> How is it that this, this man is, is sitting with people who are sinful? Doesn't he know who they are? And see, in there, the Judaism, if you touched a dead body, you were contaminated. If you you know, had a Gentile in your home, you were contaminated. And so Jesus, going to be with the publicans and sinners, the other tax collectors and people that Matthew used to run with, he, he was sinning, and he was unclean. And, you know, he can't do that. If he were really a Messiah, he would never do that. Well, so, so they, they, <laughs> they, they didn't like Jesus. And so when Jesus mingled then with these sinners, he never, he never sacrificed his principles. He never sacrificed his principles or who he was. He always was himself, no matter what company he was in. And, he, you know, it wasn't like he was only for the righteous. <laughs> he was for every individual and not, not just these self-righteous people. Um, any thoughts? Those are pretty interesting stories and ideas. They're not just stories. There are events in the life of Jesus that Mark is writing about. And remember, Mark is writing to Romans, Roman, basically Roman people. And Roman, the Roman individuals didn't um, care who, where you came from. They wanted to know what you could do. So that's why Mark is just you know, one event right after another. You know, this is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus did. So that's why, if you like just events, and that's what he's doing. Uh, chapter 2, verse 17. We jump right into the next one. When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician. So whenever he is hearing these uh, Pharisees and uh, scribes talking about him spending time with all of these sinners, um, He's, he's making it a, 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 an analogy. People don't need, people who are sick don't need a physician. You know, <laughs> we had a, a guy um, who was, uh, maybe he's watching, I don't know. But <laughs> he was here working on uh, the fur a furnace. Putting in, no, he wasn't. He was working, yeah, cleaning and uh, putting in the uh, water heater. And he was talking about the church and how full well, hypocrites churches were. 
And he was informing me as to things I didn't know about people. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. But um, anyhow, I, you know, I said, well, you know, if you go to the hospital, it has sick people. Now, there are doctors and nurses and staff. They're not sick, but they work there. But a hospital is for sick people. A church is for sick people. He says, well, I hope some of them get well pretty soon. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. We'll just have to see about that. Maybe if you stay away, they'll get better. <laughs> I, no, I didn't say that. But the idea is how that people have these misconceptions. And what happens is, if you have those types of misconceptions, you're not responsible to ever go there. See? He doesn't have to come to church. Why? Because there is nobody there worth, worth seeing. Because they're all a bunch of hypocrites. So I don't have to participate. If I go there and participate, I don't have, I'm, I'm going to be a participating with hypocrites. And I don't want to do that. So just stay with who you are, you know? <laughs> who are they? I don't know. But anyhow, we see how people have their, their, um, uh, their ide ide ideologies. They have their ideas about what life is about and how that certain people are good and not good. Well, the scribes, and even, I mean, there are churches that are very hypocritical in the sense that they are more scribes and Pharisees than they are the body of Christ. And, but that's, that's rather the... Um, that's not the rule. It's kind of like the exception. You know, most of the time people understand their relationship with God and, and that they have a need to be this person uh, like Jesus of going to people and reaching them, touching them, bringing them back to the right relationship with Christ. So when Jesus heard this of what the um, scribes and Pharisees were saying about the individuals that he was with, he said, they, ha they who are whole have no need of a physician but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, <laughs> Jesus compares healing physical ailments to healing sinners of sin. Isaiah spoke of that when he said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness, by whose wounds you have been healed. So, Christ speaks of this. Isaiah spoke of it. You know, how that the, the healing of sinners is like the healing of the body. You know, by his stripes we are healed. So in the very act of God on the cross where he purchased our salvation, he also provided for our healing. And so there, there is healing in the name of Jesus. And so there is forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And, you know... We need to act upon what we know and leave the rest up to God. <laughs> so um, the Pharisees completely miscomprehended the purpose of Christ's mission. They had believed the Messiah would obliterate sinful people and elevate the righteous. <laughs> okay, you get that? They believed that the Messiah would obliterate sinful people and elevate the righteous. They thought if he was really the Messiah, they would be elevated in position. And all the rest would be beneath them. They had little use for the one who received and forgave and transformed sinners. They uh, transformed the sinner while dismissing the self-righteous as hypocrites. <laughs> So Jesus was not going to um, you know, come the way they wanted him. You know, they thought, and see, we often think, you know, okay, these individuals, and I've, I've said it many times over, that the individuals wanted a Messiah who would, you know, kick out the Romans. But they also wanted a Messiah who would elevate them and reward them for being so self-righteous. So, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, so it's, it's like they saw themselves as being very unique and close to God, and when God comes, they're going to be even higher on the social, spiritual ladder. And whenever Jesus was, you know, confronting them in their misconceptions, they did not feel higher, they felt lower. And so, therefore, he is really off base.
uh, verse 18. And Jesus said unto them, um, Can the children of the bride, bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they, are, they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Well, um, this one is about how that while the bridegroom is there, often, well, the, the idea is that the bridegroom is there with them, okay? It isn't like he's off somewhere else. He's there with them, and they are celebrating the wedding. And, and, and you know, you don't fast while you're celebrating the wedding, you know. Uh, you go to the wedding and to the reception. I'm not eating now because I'm fasting today because it's, you know, it's your wedding. That's what, and Jesus is telling them, he, his people, were, weren't, they weren't being like what the Pharisees were expecting them because he was still with them. The time will come when I'm not here that this will happen, but that's not today. And then he goes on to talk about the, the garment and uh, putting a new piece of garment on an old piece of clothes. He was talking about today's fashions. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I don't know what do you do with all the holes. But anyhow, <laughs> he was put a new piece of garment on an on, uh, old garment. He says, you can't do that. And he says, you don't put new wine in old wineskins because the new wine, it, you know, it's still working and processing. It'll just burst, you know, the, the, the old wineskin. So you put new wine in, you know. So that was something that they could, uh, they could perhaps relate to. So the truth was proclaiming like new wine could not be confined within the old. So meaning that Jesus and who he is and what he represent cannot be confined within the old system. The old system that you, individuals, scribes, Pharisees, and so on, the old system that you are declaring to be true is my, what I am presenting can't be confined within that system. So verse 23, And it came to pass that uh, he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. Um, so, you know, Jesus... He just had a way of doing things. <laughs> it would be like, uh, to the scribes and Pharisees, he was just an irritant, you know, because he won't listen to their rules. So he's walking through the fields, and they considered, they considered the idea that the, the disciples were picking an ear of corn. They were harvesting. And when they were shucking or whatever the uh, kernels off, they were gleaning their corn, and that is completely forbidden on the Sabbath day. So they were all over Jesus for that. Um, I, I like this. I didn't realize this, that they had it broken down. The scribes and Pharisees had it broken down to the point of what you could do on the Sabbath day. Example, the quantity of an item that might be carried on the Sabbath. You ready? How much can you carry on the Sabbath without breaking the Sabbath? It must be less in bulk than a dried fig. <laughs> a dried fig, all right? How much does a dried fig weigh? You can't even carry your shoes. <laughs> okay? If honey, only as much as would anoint a wound, so... You can only have enough honey to anoint a wound. Anything extra is a sin. And if you are carrying ink, only as much ink as could be used in light, writing two letters. <laughs> so this is how audacious, how, how ridiculous the, the, the scribes and Pharisees had taken their laws to. You know, in Jesus, he says, uh, he tells them, you know, Sabbath was, you know, made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the, the Sabbath, in our relationship, was good, our relationship with God is not meant to be so restrictive that we can't be who we are and deal with life. You know, uh, we are made for, we are made to serve God. And, uh, and, and in serving God, we find out he's already been serving us. Verse 25. 
And they said unto them, Have you never read that David did when he had need? He was a hungered, and he and uh, they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat of the showbread. So he's letting them know, if, if you, in all of your studies, <laughs> I just think that's funny. You know, they, they, they prided themselves in how smart they were. They prided themselves in their knowledge of, every, of, of all of the scriptures. And Jesus says, in your studies, have you ever considered David <laughs> and what he did? So he's reminding them that David was fleeing from King Saul and he entered the tabernacle and collected holy bread for himself and his hungry men, even though it was <clears throat> lawful for anyone except for the priest to, to eat. So, so this, this incident of Sabbath breaking, Jesus used the occasion to act to set aside ceremonial law for a good and sufficient reason. So Jesus is helping, <laughs> trying to get them to understand he's setting aside the ceremonial law because the sufficient reason is his disciples were hungry. So they're not really breaking the law of God, just your law. And then verse 1 of chapter 3. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a, a man, three men there, which had a withered hand. And he said unto them, okay, there you go, scribes, Pharisees, you guys watching here, okay, pay attention. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or, do, or to do evil? Is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? Got to make, make up your mind here. To save life or to kill? They held their peace. So... <clears throat> What Jesus is doing here, he's challenging that um, the custom, you know, what their customs were in the synagogue. A man with a withered right hand enters the scene. Luke says he was a stonemason and totally unable to follow his trade. And so with the Pharisees present, um, <laughs> they were not there to worship. <laughs> they were to gain knowledge from, or to gain knowledge from reading the scriptures. But they were there to spy on Jesus. What's he going to do next? And so um, Jesus asked the enemies what he should do. What, am I, what, what should I do with this man? Would they allow him to bestow an incalculable blessing? Or did they insist that he must remain the way he was rather than be healed on the Sabbath? He's trying to get them to choose. If a man is sick unto death, must he be left to die? when help could save his life? So would they not then by saying that it is lawful to kill a man on the Sabbath because you can't help him? He's taking their, their way of thinking, he's taking it to another degree. You know, if we can't do good to help people, and especially a person who is sick, then you let that man die. Is that, is that lawful to kill a man on the Sabbath? rather than help him. So Jesus, after he pleaded his case, he looked into the hearts of those about him and saw only hardness and hatred and bitterness towards him. To the man with the withered hand, Christ merely said, stretch forth thy hand. Now remember, their philosophy, their idea is they are sinful. That's why they've had this problem. And their sins must be forgiven in order for them to have healing and recovery. So when Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, he didn't do anything. He just said, stretch forth your hand, and it was healed. And so they were left in a dilemma. Did, did he break the Sabbath or didn't he? Did he, you know, is, was his word capable of healing? And it was. And so in their assumption, he must also be forgiven or he wouldn't be healed. And so, disappointed and their pride being humbled, their plans to entrap Jesus failed. The Pharisees, and then the Pharisees joined with the Herodians to plot to destroy Jesus. There again, he didn't really break their law, but he, he challenged and confronted them 
at their beliefs and they couldn't, they couldn't just let it go or see that the mission of Jesus was to make people better. They left there and went and consulted with the Herodians to see how they could kill Jesus and put him to death. So we know that people, well, sometimes, well, how can we say God has a way of searching the hearts and knows the heart. And he isn't a heart that is open and, and, um, to Jesus and a heart that is receptive to doing, receiving good and doing good. He, he's not condemning. And his goal is not to hurt, but to heal and to restore. And so if we're ever confronted with our thoughts and our, our ways by the Holy Spirit, it's only that God wants to bring us closer to him. But too often people, <laughs> they turn uh, away from the truth, and rather than facing the truth of their life, they try to find a way to destroy that which, is made, <laughs> which has challenged them. And um, God has the final say. So when our life is over, we're all going to stand before him, so we might as well start now <laughs> and make sure that we are who we are, and we know we are. We are this person by the grace of God. And if there are things that need to be challenged and changed, we allow the Holy Spirit to bring that to us, and God will help us and uh, will lead us through these changes so that we can become stronger in our faith and stronger in what God has for us. Father, we thank you that you have heard our prayers, and God, your word that is ever a light to our path and Lord, a light to our hearts. We just ask your blessing now and the leading of your spirit to bring us closer to you. May we not be like these scribes and Pharisees and these so-called religious individuals. May our hearts be open to you and to what you want to do in our lives. So we thank you. And may the misconceptions we have, whether it be prideful or whether it be sinful, whatever, the, whatever it is in our way, Lord, we pray that you will make us aware of it. And Lord, continue to guide us step by step and bless our lives, our families, our community, our congregation, Lord, our nation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.